and gentlemen, please welcome journalist and author Molly Knight. Hi there. So we're just going to show a quick video to introduce our next guest, uh, the Dodgers' current general manager, who's a very busy man this week, <laughs> Farhan Zaidi. So check it out. Their new general manager, Farhan Zaidi, a Canadian-born Muslim Pakistani who grew up in the Philippines. And just from a baseball standpoint, it's really exciting, you know, the opportunity here. A's GM Billy Bean has described Saidi as, quote, absolutely brilliant. Zaidi lived in Manila from ages 3 to 17, while his father worked for the Asian Developmental Bank. He attended international high school in Manila and played Little League Baseball. With degrees in economics from Cal and MIT, he worked 10 years for the Oakland Athletics, elevating to assistant GM before joining the Dodgers late last year. And here's Mr. Farhan Zaidi. <laughs> Here. So is this the busiest week of the year for you? Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, uh, you know, we had the uh, war room set up uh, in our <laughs> offices in L.A., so I had to sneak out of there. But very excited to be here. Thank you all for having me. Sheikh Faisal, thank you very much uh, for having me. And, uh, you know, we were happy to be able to be of help to you and uh, hope to continue the relationship. But excited to be here. For those who don't know, this is the Major League Baseball trading deadline is coming up on Friday. So he's responsible for building a, a championship team and bringing a championship to L.A. for the first time in 27 years. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and Molly's already given me a pep talk about all the things <laughs> that we need to do to get that done. So uh, I know exactly what to do when I get when back I'm to the <laughs> office in a little while. <laughs> so we wanted to start just with your background and because and you have a very unusual um, backstory, sort of you were born in Canada. So you're a Canadian technically? Yes, technically that's right. But you, when did you move to the Philippines? Uh, so I was born in Canada. My family's originally from Pakistan. Uh -huh. uh, my father migrated to Canada to begin his career as an engineer um, and was married and had first two of uh, his and my uh, mother's children there. We moved to the Philippines when I was very young, four years old, and I grew up there, went through high school there, and then came to the U.S. for college in 94 and has been here since. How many languages do you speak? <laughs> S sadly, very few for that background. <laughs> but um, it also depends whether you're talking about speaking languages fluency, fluently or at a five-year-old's level. <laughs> if you're talking five-year-old level, uh, two or three. But, uh, th but this is the one language I'm really comfortable in. And then you came back to the States to go to college? Correct, yes. You were at M MIT for That's to start? That's right. Mm -hmm. And you your degree is in um, compu computer science? It's in uh, economics. Economics, mm -hmm. okay. And so how in the world did you go from MIT economics to now <laughs> being in charge of a baseball club? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was, I think, mostly a tale of good fortune. I, I started out working in management consulting straight out of school and, um, you know, played baseball uh, when I was younger, played baseball in high school, always had the dream of getting involved in sports. Um, so I worked in management consulting for a couple of years. Then I actually worked at a sports startup uh, mm -hmm. that did fantasy games in New York for a year after that, um, you know, to try to scratch that sport itch. And uh, after that, I always had an interest in studying further in economics, and I wound up going uh, to Berkeley uh, to enroll in the economics PhD program there, right. uh, which is like witness protection from sports. <laughs> I don't think any professional sports franchises were going to seek me out there, but... Uh, while I was in grad school, you know, as a hobby almost, I would just go on uh, baseball team websites and, like, look at the job postings. Mm -hmm. And uh, in late 2004, I happened to see a job posting with the Oakland A's. Uh, it looked like just a really good fit uh, for my background, and I just read Moneyball, so was very <laughs> inspired by that. Uh, thought that even, you know, as bad of a player as I was in my day, <laughs> that Billy would forgive me, Billy Bean would forgive me for that, and hired me on the basis of my skills, and uh, I submitted my resume, and 10 days later, I was walking into Billy's office for an interview. It was completely surreal. Uh, I had no uh, connections with anyone in their office, hadn't met anybody there before, but the interview just, you know, went really well, and a couple of weeks later, I'd started with EA, so it was 
really just very serendipitous that I wound up in that position. I'm obviously really grateful to Billy. So I heard a few funny things about that interview process. <laughs> I heard that sure. first off, uh, that you were actually at that point, even though you had been you had been doing your degree at Berkeley, that you were back uh, finishing it up at Harvard, right. and that you, uh, when they called you saying they wanted to interview you, you you made up a fake house hunting trip to go <laughs> back correct. because you knew that they that the cash as having read Moneyball, you knew that the organization didn't have any money, right? And they weren't going to be able to pay to fly you to come back. Uh, uh, so you you took it in your own matters in your own hands. That that's exactly right. I um. <laughs> You know, David Force, the assistant GM, who I'm, I'm very close with now uh, and uh, is contemporary of mine, uh, we're the same age. He called me uh, to mention they had interest in, in uh, interviewing me, and I, I did mention that, you know, I was in Boston doing a year, uh, doing a, a, I was a visiting student at Harvard for that year. I mean, that's kind of when he started backpedaling a little <laughs> and saying, well, we're looking for someone local, so. Um, and I actually was headed back to uh, California to get back to Berkeley at the beginning of that next calendar year in a few weeks. Um, so yeah, just on the fly, I said, well, I'm coming back there anywhere for a house hunting trip. Um, there was no house hunting actually <laughs> done on that trip. Um, and uh, you know, I still joke with, with David that I've got to send him the bill for that plane <laughs> flight. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, I, if, if there's kind of, you know, uh, a lesson from that or something a little less lighthearted than, you know, it feels telling the story now, it's just, you know, sports, professional sports is so hard to break into that, you know, when the door cracks open a little, you just have to do everything to push your way through it. Uh, and, you know, you still need a lot of good fortune and you need to sort of run into the right people. But, you know, for anybody looking to get involved in it, you know, any younger people that are out there, that would be my, my one bit of advice is don't leave anything to chance. Just control everything that's within your control. And maybe to also write that you enjoy Britpop on your resume because <laughs> That's right. Billy Bean is an Oasis fan and they bonded over that That's in their right. interview. So this was 2005, <laughs> which was really after Britpop's true heyday. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the, the fact that Britpop was still on my resume was a little bit of a historical accident. <laughs> I just, I was in grad school, so I wasn't really job hunting at all. I hadn't updated my resume in three or four years. Um, and so when I touched it up before sending it off to the A's, I didn't even notice it was still on there because it was kind of deeply embedded in interest. And that was one of the first questions Billy asked me. He said, so I see you have, um, you know, Britpop listed in your interest. <laughs> and I almost just wanted to say, should I just pack my bag now or is this interview <laughs> over? Uh, and uh, um, he actually said, no, I, I love Oasis. And, and we wound up talking about that for 10 or 15 minutes. And David Forrest, who was also in the room, was just left to kind of roll his eyes as we like went through our favorite <laughs> Oasis songs. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, another example of, of just getting lucky, you know, yeah. and having a shared interest there. You mentioned whenever you see uh, this, this, this business is so hard to break into, whenever you see a t tiny crack in the door, you've got to push it open. And we talked before, one of the things I, I love about Farhan is, uh, one of the many things is, is baseball is, is pretty much dominated by um, white, white guys, <laughs> uh, middle-aged white dudes, nothing wrong, but it's nice to see some, some different people, some, some people from different backgrounds, different genders, different, different everything. And, and I just wanted to know, what has that been like for you to be one of the few, I mean, he's the only Muslim American GM in any sport. And I just wanted to know, what's it been like for you to sort of fill? Yeah, know. I, you know, I, I guess more than anything else, you know, I just got really lucky to have Billy as an advocate in my first job. I mean, working for the Oakland A's when Billy Bean has given you a stamp of credibility, <laughs> I think <laughs> helps a lot. Um, and that, I think, really mitigated whatever effect, you know, my having an unusual background or being from, you know, being, you know, sort of a minority in this country, uh, what, you know, what that might have otherwise meant for my career uh, and the relationships I developed. You know, at this point, I do view myself a, a, as someone who thinks baseball as an industry needs to move more in that direction, needs to be sort of more open-minded, and not just open-minded, but aggressive about bringing in uh, diversity into the sport. Um, you know, I think one area where baseball has really tried to aggressively grow is just grow the sport internationally, and I think that will help a lot. But, you know, there's a significant gender divide in baseball, and, and we were talking earlier there's so many meetings I sit in where I look around the room and there isn't a single woman in the room. And, you know, as somebody that's, that's worked uh, in other industries, 
that was pretty jarring to me at first, uh, and it's still something that I'm very uncomfortable with. And I, you know, I, I just hope that we continue to move to, to sort of equate some of those, uh, um, you know, disparities in, in, in sort of the profile of people that work in the game. What do you think we can do to make it more inclusive? Uh, that's a good question. I know MLB is working a lot on that, making baseball not just more um, appealing uh, to women as fans, but also to women as careers. Um, and again, I, I think just growing the sport internationally uh, is, uh, you know, a big part of that because, you know, MLB, even looking at something like the World Baseball Classic, I know their aspirations to get that on the same level as the World Cup and some of the other really big international events that captivate the entire globe's attention. Uh, and I think baseball has an uphill climb as far as that goes, but I think awareness is the biggest thing. Um, and then for us who work in the game, you know, when we have job openings to really aggressively seek minority candidates, uh, women candidates, uh, just to create some exposure for them uh, and, you know, make people feel like it's really accessible. I mean, I, you know, going back to my, um, you know, my background, you know, it, it's kind of almost a joke now to say I read Moneyball and I was like, oh, I got to work for this guy. But, you know, one thing that for me, reading through that book and reading about, you know, Paul De Podesta, somebody who also didn't play baseball in college, uh, and just, you know, the type of things Billy said in the book about, you know, what he was looking for in a front office, it just made me feel like it was attainable. Mm -hmm. So I think as an industry and as individual organizations, we, ha we just have to make employment in our game seem attainable to people, and I think the rest will take care of itself. That, that's a good point. I think as, as baseball has become, more people who have been coming from management backgrounds or computer science backgrounds have been have been drawn to, to the game versus just the old school guys who are former players. How has that, since you've been in the game the last 10 years, with all of this data-driven and Sabre stuff and, and all of that, how has that, how has that changed who you're seeing apply for jobs or who, who's becoming more interested in a career in this? Yeah, uh, when uh, I came over to uh, the Dodgers uh, last November, one of our main objectives was to build out a research and development department. Um, and you know, thus far, a lot of our efforts there have been around recruiting and hiring, just building that department out. And it sort of required us to do some things that are unconventional as far as baseball, you know, recruiting goes, which, you know, baseball recruiting is usually the candidates just come to you. I mean, you know, every day I walk into my office and I have sort of a pile of resumes to sort through. Um, and I think a lot of people in baseball have that. Um, so to go from just sorting through the resumes that you get in to actually going out and aggressively trying to hire people with certain skills, um, you know, for the first time this year, we actually recruited at some college campuses and tried to have a presence there in career services offices to have job listings in those career services offices um, at some schools around the country. Uh, and I think baseball will start moving more in that direction. You know, and, and, and one thing that I would like to see is for us to start competing with you know, the Fortune 500 companies and, and the investment banks and the management consulting firms for some of the top undergraduates out there. I think that's sort of a, a pipeline of, of real talent, not just for baseball, but all sports. Interesting. So to have work for sort of recruiters going to some of these top programs and looking for specific people for certain right, roles. Right. Absolutely. I mean, that's sort of, you know, working at a management consulting firm, I was not only sort of part of that rec recruiting process as a candidate, but actually went to schools and, uh, and, and did the recruiting once I worked there. So I think for sports organizations, that's probably the next frontier. And for you, from going from an organization famous for its its having to find creative ways to win with because they had a limited budget to going for a t to a team with no budget. What have been the biggest differences for you in, in this change? Well, um, you'll have to run that no budget line by Stan Cast <laughs> and see, see how he feels about it. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, it's, it's, it, it's been a change and, you know, it, it's very topical right now uh, with the trade deadline. Um, you know, where, you know, Andrew Friedman, the president of baseball operations who worked for the Rays, Tampa Rays previously, and, and myself, you know, we're usually in a mode at this time of year where our objective was find value in the market. And a lot of times the value in this market is to be a seller, you know, because there are teams that are in pennant races that are willing to make trades that they ordinarily wouldn't be willing to make just out of a sense of urgency, if not desperation. Um, now we're a buyer and we're in a big market with big expectations um, and we almost have to be more open-minded about making trades that 
you know, maybe in an actuarial sense won't work out for us. We're giving up young players, cheaper players that might provide better bang for the buck for their organization going forward. But our objective is less about that and more about putting the best team on the field possible. Uh, so I think we've had to adjust our thinking that way a little. Does that mean you guys are going to go get David Price? <laughs> <laughs> I knew this whole interview was <laughs> building up to a question no, about okay. a specific player, whether no, we were going to trade for him or not. <laughs> I'm just but kidding. But we are, I mean, uh, you know, in all seriousness, uh, you know, it, it really is our goal to go out there and, and improve the team as much as possible in this week. So I'm really hoping that, uh, you know, we have an announcement to make that's going to make our fans happy in the next few days. <laughs> where do you see baseball in 10 years? Where do you, where do you see the game changing? Um, you know, I, I think there's two different uh, strands to that question. You know, one is how the product on the field is going to change, and one is, which we've already touch, touched about, how the face of baseball is going to change. I mean, on the field, you know, technology in baseball is, um, you know, as big of uh, an issue as it is in any other sport, um, both in terms of how it is used to evaluate players and from a front office standpoint, but also to enhance the fan experience. I mean, there are a lot of teams out there that are getting into virtual reality, and you may get to a point where you can be sitting on your couch at home, be wearing a virtual reality device, and feel like you are at the game, you know, or even on the field. So I think sort of creating that immersive fan experience, it's going to look very different in 10 years. Um, and, uh, you know, as far as the tools we're developing, you know, with the onset of StatCast this year, uh, you know, getting sort of very high level of detail on you know every split second of, of action on the field um, is, is probably going to change not just the way we evaluate players but which players are really viewed as valuable so it's going to be interesting to see how the player market evolves and then finally you know on the uh, side of the face of the game you know I, I just hope we see a lot more diversity in the game not just on the field but in front offices and among our fans so I think that's definitely something we could see in the next decade. Well, thank you so much for your time. This is uh, the busiest week of your year, I think, and this is valuable. Ch I, I hope you don't go backstage and see that somebody has traded for a player <laughs> that you want. Um, All right. It's been, it's been wonderful I to talk with you. And I know as an advocate of the organization, you really want me to get right back to work. I certainly so. do. <laughs> <laughs> go do that. Thank so you very much. Thank you. Farhan Zaidi represents opportunity. Farhan Zaidi has opened many, many doors for future generations and visible minorities. Um, from his humble beginnings in the Philippines to now becoming uh, general manager of the most iconic, one of the most iconic uh, sports brands in the world, the LA Dodgers, this is a very big success story. Uh, Farhan is a role model for many uh, visible minorities who are hoping to pursue a career in executive sports management. So on behalf of Doha Goals and Sheikh Faisal, we would like to recognize Farhan and present him a gift on our behalf and wish him the very best in promoting further diversity and inclusivity in Major League Baseball. Thank you very much. Thank you.